This episode of Nocturne is brought to you with the support of Casper. You can get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash nocturne and using promo code nocturne. As the weather gets cooler and the days get shorter, I think about snuggling up in bed with a book and a cup of tea. If you're looking forward to hunkering down in the longer nights, consider doing it with a springy new mattress. The Casper is obsessively engineered at a shockingly fair price. Made in America, it combines latex and supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep surface that Time Magazine named one of the best inventions of 2015. Try a Casper for 100 nights, and if you don't love it, they'll take it away and give you a refund. Free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada. Go to casper.com slash nocturne and use promo code nocturne to save $50. You're listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. The police play an important role in civil society. Their first mandate is to serve and protect the ultimate goal being the maintenance of social order. Often this is accomplished without undue assaults on individual liberty. But many factors come into play in the tension between freedom and order. It can be a fine balancing act without clear edges. And it only takes one dark night to color lasting impressions. My name is Maurice Tanny and I'm a musician playing professionally since I was a teenager. I'm a singer-songwriter. I think of my stuff as being essentially rooted in old-style country music. Maurice is a constructive member of society, mostly law-abiding, even back in the 1970s, widely considered a time of social unrest when the story takes place. This is 1974. I must have been about 21. 1974 was kind of an interesting time sociologically and politically in San Francisco where this takes place. This is the time of Patty Hearst and the SLA. In case you're not up on your 1970s San Francisco history, Patty Hearst was the granddaughter of the publishing magnate William Randolph Hearst. She was kidnapped and indoctrinated by the Symbionese Liberation Army when she was 19 and a student at Berkeley. The SLA was considered a left-wing terrorist group. The Summer of Love was in the past at this point. What had happened on Haight Street in the 60s was pretty well dead. The hallucinogens and the happy sort of drugs had been replaced a lot by, uh, by harder drugs, and the music had turned harder, the, the local scene had, had turned harder, and the relationship between the police and the counterculture was rough, to say the least. Maurice was definitely a part of the counterculture. He was a long-haired, self-proclaimed hippie in San Francisco in the 70s, active in peace protests and a musician to boot. But he hadn't had any serious clashes with the police until this particular night. I was rehearsing with some friends in a flat in the Western Edition in San Francisco. Gritty kind of area at the time, a rough kind of neighborhood. And uh, the police were on a stakeout up the street, and they were looking for Patty Hearst. This was right in that period with the SLA and there were uh, police shootings and it was a lot of violence and she had held up a bank out in the Sunset District and uh, we were sort of free jamming, uh, it was jazz rock and I can't recall the name of the band. We had been rehearsing in this flat and we went out to dinner and we came back about sunset, just as it was getting dark and I had a VW bus at the time, it was a true hippie van. And I pull up in front of the, the building that we were rehearsing in. And I get out and, uh, and about six other long-haired hippies get out of the back of the van with me and we go upstairs into the flat and we start rehearsing. About an hour later, I guess, somebody's banging on the front door. We were playing and uh, not really paying much attention to it, and there were other people in the house. And we just kept going, and the, the banging 
went on for a while, doorbell, and got fairly insistent. And the guy who lived there, his roommate, went down the stairs to uh, uh, see who it was. And he peeked through the spy hole in the door, and there was a couple of uh, long-haired guys down there. And he opens the door, and the, the guy says, this is where the party is? And the guy says, no, no, it's no party, it's just... Uh, and he didn't get much farther than that. And they pushed the door open and two more hippie looking sort of guys and four police forced their way into the building and push him to the side and march up the stairs towards where we were. So we were still playing upstairs and there were, I guess, uh, about five of us in the room. I was sitting facing the, the middle of the room, facing a keyboard player across from me and I'm playing and this hippie guy, long-haired guy, jumps into the room in sort of a crouch position. He's facing the keyboard player in front of me and he's showing him something. I don't see what it is, but we continue playing. I figured it's some friend of his making a joke or something. But he stops and has kind of a shocked look on his face and the guy turns to each person in the room and when he turns to me, I see he's holding up police identification, a badge and an ID. And one by one, we all stop. And I look up, and the place is full of cops. There were, a, there were at least eight of them in there, plain clothes and uniformed officers. And they, um, they just basically held us in the room while they went through the place. And uh, we must have sat there for about an hour or so while they went through the place. They went to each room and uh, searched cabinets, drawers, um, whatever and they uh so they got everybody else that was in the house and there was probably a total of about 10 people all together uh brought us all in the room they never really spoke to us very much i didn't know what they were looking for we were sort of blown away that they uh, decided that we were something worth spending that much time and energy on they hadn't searched us or anything. They just, they went through the house and after about an hour or so, they called two paddy wagons, vans, police vans. And then they led us all down the stairs out into these paddy wagons. And at this point, it must've been about 11 at night. It's dark outside and we were scared. It was surreal and we were probably stoned, but probably not very stoned at that point. <laughs> There's no buzzkill like a police raid. One moment, they're jamming in a living room, and the next, they're all squished together in the back of a van. Black and white vans with, you know, screen in the front. They're sealed up. There's no windows in them. It was pretty dark in the back of the van. Just two benches on each side of the thing. And we're sitting in the back of the van with five people. It was all pretty obvious that they were taking us down to the jail <laughs> and that basically they were looking for drugs. They took all of us down to the Hall of Justice. We sit in the booking area for quite a while, and it's, it's weird in there. This is the dregs of pretty much everybody dragged off the street at uh, that time of night. There was a short sigh of relief as they were led out of that area. They, uh, they took us into a room, and this room had nothing in it. It was as stark as a room could possibly be. It was just cement walls. There weren't even benches. We stripped down to nothing. We stood, and they, uh, they looked us over. Then we uh, turned around, hands to the wall, feet spread, and they did a cavity search. I mean, I would imagine some people think of that as being uh, humiliating and unnecessary, but at this point, we were just so frightened. It was just one more straw on the camel's back for us. That was only the beginning. Then they throw us into this holding tank. It was probably maybe 12 by 12, but there were probably 15, 20 people in that room. It was full. This isn't like a regular cell where there's a bathroom or, or a toilet or running water or anything. It's just a room with a door that has a small grated opening benches along the side, but that's it. Fluorescent light in the ceiling that is graded off because basically they're figuring that anything that's going to be in there is going to get broken or uh, it's going to get trashed or used as a weapon. The holding tank was probably the scariest moments. They s separate us. I was in the holding tank with like two other people that I knew. It was like being locked in a box full of wild animals. 
there were drunks in there and crazy people in there and uh, some very dangerous looking people in there. And this one guy that obviously had some type of mental problem and he was, um, he would get out in the, the middle of this tiny room that uh, we were in and start doing these karate moves and uh, kung fu kicks. And there was a, a, another guy there who was a quite angry and angry guy was tired of having crazy guy do his karate moves in front of him. And the two of them suddenly go at it. A riot broke out. One or two people in the room jumped into the thing, and I'm not sure whether they jumped in to try to pull them apart or whether they saw this as an opportunity to punch someone themselves. We started shouting, and I don't remember what we shouted, but we just started making a whole bunch of noise. And after a minute or so, the little tiny window uh, of, the, of the tank opens up, and a cop looks in there. And these guys are fighting, and, and we're, hey, <laughs> you know, uh, do something about this. And uh, he sees what's going on, he closes the door, and then there's a minute or two, and uh, then the door flies open, and I think four cops in basically riot gear. Uh, they've got shield, batons, pads, helmets. They come in to... Uh, break this thing up and their idea of breaking it up is essentially to beat everyone in the pile and then they grab the guys on the bottom and pull them out. It was just a lot more scary on top of already being really frightened because I mean up to this point you know it was like something bad could happen because we got arrested or our families were going to find out or it was going to cost us a bunch of money or whatever but by the time we got to this cell where the fight started breaking out we were in physical danger. Once they removed that guy, things got quiet after that, so uh, that was uh, strangely good. After about another hour or so, now it's about two or three in the morning, and uh, they lead us to the cell that uh, we're going to stay in. And how had the police treated them up to this point? The police didn't really treat us at all. They had surprisingly little to do with us. I don't think I had been asked any question. They came in, they looked for what they wanted, decided what we had, and uh, took us away. They didn't ask us anything. They had told us that we were arrested on uh, drug charges. Uh, it was possession and intent for sale, I think is what, the, what they said. I don't recall them giving us much more information than that. So they take us to the jail cells on another floor. They pop open the first cell door, and now I'm in a cell that has eight bunks in it, upper and lower metal bunks. The lights are, are very low, but you can see what's happening in the room. And uh, it's three o'clock in the morning, these other guys are sleeping in there, and uh, there's one open bunk. There's no mattress, there's no pillow on it, but I get in and uh, a guy who's already been sleeping there, he wakes up and gives me the pillow and the mattress for it because he had taken those and put them on his uh, in order to make it a little more comfortable. Maurice was still scared, but this was definitely an improvement over the holding tank. But at least it was calm there and it was quiet and nobody was really nuts there. I, uh, I lay down and uh, tried to close my eyes, but it was only like a couple of hours later that the lights all come on and the door opens up and there's breakfast and uh, that sort of thing. Breakfast didn't make the situation any less frightening. I think part of what's so scary about it is you're completely out of control. Whatever is going to happen in the situation, you have no control over it. And we were thrust into a world that didn't really have any idea how this stuff worked. I mean, we'd been to protests and that sort of thing before. And, and I actually sat in the back of a police van, but... It was more of a situation where there was a bunch of hippies and they took us someplace else and let us out and said, don't go back there, you know, or we're going to arrest you or whatever. But this was, this was very scary. It wasn't just the physical danger that troubled Maurice. I was scared more on a, on a long-term basis. What this was going to lead to down the line. At the time, in the 70s, in some states, there were people that went to prison for, you know, a gram of marijuana. In Texas, there were guys that were in there for life for tiny amounts of drugs. In San Francisco, we sort of expected that it wasn't going to be quite so harsh, but that all depended on who you got as a judge. 
the thought had occurred to me that I could potentially be there until we had a, an arraignment and a trial and, uh, and potentially sentencing. And at that point, you'd never get out, right? You could, uh, you could just go straight from there to some type of prison. This fear wasn't pulled out of thin air. Then, like today, there was tension between citizens and the police. Between the police, district attorney, the uh, relationship with counterculture was not good. You know, there would be protests and the tax squad would come and just beat people's heads in. They didn't ask a lot of questions. I was very unsure about what was going to happen. But uh, I managed to just sort of stay calm enough to uh, just to keep my mouth shut and not flip out. No one was giving Maurice and his friends a lot of information, other than the amount of bail they would need to come up with. The bail was astronomical. The last thing I was going to do was to call my folks with this sort of thing. This was a, in an age where uh, helicopter parenting wasn't something that happened yet. Whenever I got into trouble, I always figured it was my responsibility to get myself out. And so... I, uh, I waited. A couple of us just waited. I basically sat there uh, just terrified for three, four days. Somebody hired a lawyer that was going to represent all of us, not a public defender. This was a, a lawyer that I was going to defend all of us together. And that, in the end, cost me, it cost me $1,000. That was an astronomical amount of money at the time for me, but I paid it off. And finally, they let me out on my own recognizance. None of us had any record, and we were young. We, I don't think we posed much of a problem, and the majority of us were white. There was one illegal Mexican amongst us, and, um, and even he got out. It was much later that they heard the specifics of what they were accused of. In the end, we found that they claimed that we were in possession of a pound of marijuana, and an ounce of cocaine, which were very, very serious at the time. Cocaine was still very serious, but uh, there was probably an ounce of, or maybe two ounces of pot in the entire place amongst everybody at that point. But uh, there, was, there was no cocaine there. You might be wondering why Maurice and his friends even entered the police's radar. They said uh, that they had been uh, on a stakeout up, up the street looking for, uh, for Patty Hearst and that uh, or SLA people or something like that. And uh, they were up the hill from where we were. And they said they had seen in the window of the building where we were practicing a white female and a black male holding up glassine envelopes to the light. History lesson. Patty Hearst was a white woman and the leader of the SLA, Donald DeFries, a black man. As to the glassine envelopes, a glassine envelopes were the type of envelope that you would keep heroin or uh, some type of powdery uh, narcotic in. It was strange that they put this in the report because there was no white female in the group and there was no black male in the group. But that was their report. As far as Maurice can guess, the police may have seen his friend John through the window. That would have been a white guy with curly black hair, maybe holding his clarinet reed up to the light. Nevertheless, the wheels of justice rolled forward. There was an arraignment and a pretrial hearing. I was working in Texas at the time, playing down there in the circuit of clubs between uh, Dallas and Austin. And I was flying back and forth. And each one of those flights cost me basically all the money that I was making at the time, plus the $1,000 that we had to put out for the attorney. There was an arraignment when they told us what the charges were, and then uh, and I flew back to Texas, and then like uh, two weeks later, I had to come back for a pretrial hearing. And then we found out what they were claiming the evidence was, which we knew was all nonsense uh, because w there was no ounce of cocaine in the house. There was no pound of marijuana in the house. There was no white female in the house. There was no black male in the house. There were no glassine envelopes in the house. It was, there were some hippies playing progressive jazz rock. <laughs> so there was the initial raid and arrest, the strip search, the scary fight, and three or four days in jail, during which Maurice feared that he might end up in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Not to mention the money for the lawyer and traveling back and forth from work, the final reckoning was looming closer and closer. And then we were to go back for the actual trial. And they were, looked like they were going forward with this thing. 
so um, the third court appointment I've and the third flight back from Texas, we get there and uh, the cops just don't show up. They simply, uh, they, they didn't have the evidence they said they had and they didn't have, they didn't have a case, but they had let this thing go uh, all the way through. I mean, I can only think that it was, why would they do this? I've got no idea other than they wanted to make life hard for us. They wanted it to be as difficult as, uh, as they could possibly make it. And when it came time for them to show up and show the actual evidence and to present the case, they simply didn't show up. They forfeited the case. The judge says, okay, that's it. You're done. You're free to go. And it was such a mixture of relief and anger at the same time. I mean, I was, I was overjoyed and still felt so violated because it had taken months for this to play out. I mean, after that night, which was in, I think it was in October, we were well into, into the next year when they just didn't show up for court. That one night when the police raided their band practice and the events that followed, they've stuck with Maurice. In those months after we got out initially, everywhere I went, when I saw a police car, I was sure that they were they were following me. Uh, at the time, the police had uh, helicopters in San Francisco, and I would be driving, and a helicopter would appear over me. And they, they, they couldn't have been following me. I mean, I would, that was ridiculous, but I would just pull over and, uh, and, and wait until it went away because I was so paranoid. It, I mean, now it seems ridiculous to think that I was a, a, a fish big enough for them to want to follow around, but why would they have broken into our place? I mean, we were just musicians playing music. That's all we were doing. Gradually, you know, my paranoia has ebbed, but uh, it, it lives with me to this day. Not so much do I think that they're following me, but I know what the police are capable of. I know what kind of power they've got, and I know what kind of people can be drawn to that, that kind of work. And that, just as a status quo, is scary. To this day, I still have, I see police behind me, I see police, I, I'm, I get this feeling inside that anything could happen. They simply need to say whatever they want to happen, and it's going to happen, and then it has to play out. And whether it actually sticks later or not, that's entirely up to them, really. Uh, they can make your life hell, whether they have anything or not. The thing I come away with that I think is more or less the lesson, not so much for me, but in my view of the world, is that I was a hippie. And I think that because we were a bunch of alternative culture-looking people, I think that's why we were targeted. We were in, uh, in a black neighborhood. We were the wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time. If I had been in Pacific Heights or a nice neighborhood and we had looked straight, I doubt this would have happened. And I could cut my hair. I could move to another district and this wouldn't have happened. But if I was black, I can't change the color of my skin. And economically, the odds on my being able to move to another area are uh, certainly more restricted. And what happened to me was the worst incident that I had had with the police. I had had other incidents. This one was definitely the most toxic of the, of the bunch. But once I stopped looking that way, I really haven't had that much more trouble with the police. I've been stopped you know, for a traffic thing now and then, but nothing that went this far. Before I was a hippie, it didn't really uh, happen. And after I was a hippie, it didn't really happen just because I had that look. The look symbolized my 
counterculture leanings. And counterculture was counter to the culture that the police represented. Minority groups in general are counter to the culture that the police represent. There are people of color that are targeted for this very same reason, and it's going to happen for all of their life. Maurice was left with a lingering sense of helplessness and frustration about his interaction with the police. And it's affected his wider perspective on law enforcement in general and its role in society. There was no going to the police and saying that I want compensation for this. You don't do that with the police. There's the loss of your time. There's the loss of your money. But there's your loss in confidence in the body of people that are supposed to be protecting us. That, I think, is the thing that will last me the rest of my life. There are good cops, and cops that I actually know and, uh, and have had good experiences with. But I know that there's no shortage of bad apples in the barrel. And it draws a certain personality type that can become addicted to the power involved with it. And it's dangerous. They look at people the way they were raised to look at people. And we aren't all raised to look at people the same way. They looked at us in a way that, that we didn't really count as, as people. I mean, like I said, they never talked to me. They arrested me. They threw me in jail. They never interviewed me. They never asked me any questions. I was just part of a group of people that they had made assumptions about and allegations about. And... I was the one who paid the price in spite of the fact that no crime, uh, you know, uh, certainly not the crimes that they were talking about had been committed. I can see how what we're seeing right now with the frustration with police violence towards minorities, people of color uh, across the country boils over. I, I can see how angry you could get with a lifetime of this type of behavior, of a lifetime of these experiences. I mean. I'm hostile towards the police. And this is something that happened decades ago. It, it formed my opinion about what uh, the police are capable of. I've heard a lot of comments from people, mostly white people, that black people are destroying their own community and that they don't really understand how they can be so angry and that racism is something that has ebbed in this country. For me, uh, racism is an avenue that uh, that people with power uh, use as a weapon against certain groups of people. And that police power, it can be abused. And when you are part of a group of people that you can't switch out of, you are the target of this. And I, I understand how... It can make you angry, it can make you bitter, and it can make you hostile and uh, make you paranoid. A lifetime of anger is going to have to manifest itself in some way. And I can see how, you know, you want to push back against that, but at the same time, pushing back against it can lead to devastating consequences. There might be physical harm involved, or it might be uh, simply that you're going to be broke, or it might be that you can't get a job. But there's going to be consequences for pushing back against it. And it's, it's unfair, it's not right. And, and I think that we all have every right to be angry about that. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Nocturne is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. Thanks to Maurice Tanney for sharing his story. You can find a link to his music in the show notes for this episode at nocturnepodcast.org. Nocturne is a proud founding member of The Herd, an audio storytelling collective, including the show Arrivals. Here's a clip from a recent episode. And I felt the air of the mud flaps like over my face. And it was just 
terrifying because it was like I was in an action movie. And I was like, nobody survives this. People say, I feel like I got run over by a truck, but nobody gets run over by a truck. That doesn't happen. Check out all the shows in The Herd at theherdradio.com. That's H-E-A-R-D. Thanks for listening.